What if you choose your best course of treatment and your health insurer won't pay for it? Have insurers ever denied Y90 treatments? Yes. Have they ever denied chemoembolization of the liver? Yes. Have they ever denied monoclonal antibodies? Why? Because monoclonal antibodies are rather expensive. They've even denied the external pump for sandostatin, haven't they? What word did they use to deny all of these treatments? They said, we're not paying for that Y90. It's experimental. experimental. See, you already know. Once upon a time, back in 2006, a very nice gentleman called me from Atlanta. He said, my wife needs Y90 treatments, and our insurer won't pay. After I got done asking, what are Y90 treatments, I said, I'm going to help you write an appeal. And together, we're going to make them pay. Three days later, they had their approval, and his wife had her surgery, her treatment. That was in 2007, and she's doing very well, thank you. I came all the way from Seattle to ask you one question. What good is your best course of treatment if the insurer won't pay? My name is Lori Todd. I am the insurance warrior. <laughs> Thank you. There is no other insurance warrior. In March of 2005, I was diagnosed with a late-stage abdominal cancer, rushed into surgery, and given months to live. I immediately lost my business, my income, my savings. In due time, I was sent to the oncologist who said, and he said it just like this, there is no treatment for your disease. And even if there were, they wouldn't pay for it. What would you do? I became the insurance warrior. It didn't take me long to get on the computer and discover that there was a tried and proven treatment for my disease involving another 16-hour surgery and intraperitoneal chemotherapy. All roads led to Dr. Sugarbaker in Washington, D.C., my one chance to survive. Not only did my insurer consider this treatment to be experimental, but it was also out of network, and I had no out of network benefit, the infamous HMO. So I wouldn't be allowed to have it. To die? because my insurer didn't want to pay for it? Ridiculous. Embarrassing. Sort of like getting run over by the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. <laughs> I would have felt like the biggest chump of the universe. I just couldn't let it happen. I spent two months reading, studying, gathering proof, Nobody thought that I would win this case. What I really needed was the finest lawyer that money could buy. However, since I had no money, I had to turn myself into that lawyer. Three days after receiving my 23-page 20 page war documents, the insurance company called me. That was a first. They said, hmm. We decided to pay. I must have scared them pretty badly because they also paid my deductible, my out-of-pocket. They paid it all. 
My treatment during 2005 probably cost about $345,000. People, that's a cheap date for a cancer cure. But substantial money nonetheless. My out of pocket for 2005 was $9. That would be nine. And being me, when I got back to Seattle, I got a bill from the hospital in Washington, D.C. for $9. I called them up. I said, what's the $9 for? And they said, you asked for a glass of juice in the hospital. I said, I'm a big spender. I'll send you the check for $9. <clears throat> As of today, four years later, I just won my 50th appeal. All different diseases and conditions, all different insurers, all over the country. All for treatments costing between 100000 and about a half million dollars. All one in a week or less. When it comes to insurance, everything is negotiable. Bingo, you're the attorney. But only if you negotiate. Treatments are denied with words. And denials are overturned with words. Very simple, sim simpler than you think. Insurers always use the same three reasons for denying treatments. It's simple. They either say it's out of network, it's not medically necessary, or it's experimental. Just three reasons, easy as pie. Which word do they use to deny all of your own pertinent treatments? It's experimental. In other words, your insurance challenges are going to boil down to just one word. If one word is the cause of all your insurance denials, don't you want to know what that word means? What does experimental mean? Not proven? Does it mean not very many peer-reviewed medical journal articles? Does it mean uh, no randomized trials? Could it perhaps mean uh, uh, not FDA approved? It doesn't mean any of those. There is no agreed upon definition of experimental. It means whatever they say it means. It means they don't want to pay for it. Bingo. How do I know this? I'm from Seattle. I have fought Regents, our largest insurer, six times for the same treatment for six different patients. Each time they deny it as experimental, I prove my case, they pay, and when the next poor suffering soul comes along, they deny it again as experimental. So if they call your treatment experimental, people, it did not come down to Moses on the mountaintop. They've already paid for it. They've paid for it hundreds of times. They just don't want to pay for it again. If you argue your appeal based on what you think experimental means, you miss the mark. What are the first three things that regular people do when their treatment is denied? Number one, they panic. Number two, they call their insurance company. The insurance company is my friend. I know that if I just call them and explain to them that I need this treatment to survive, of course they'll pay for it. Have you ever tried to call your insurance company? I wouldn't recommend it. I have a motto. The only reason to call your insurance company is to find out where to write to. Do you ever notice that all those people you talk to on the phone don't give you their last name? When you write your appeal, you're going to find their last name. 
and it's going to be on your appeal. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to pay. The insurance company will not help you make themselves pay. The next thing they do is they call their doctor. I feel your pain. We want to believe that there's some outside professional who will help us. However, bless your hearts, the physicians don't have a lot of influence with the insurance company these days. I've seen doctor appeals. They're on ver doctor's appeals. They're on very nice stationery. They're usually one page long. And they say, uh, this is the patient, and I'm the treating physician, and in my professional opinion, the patient needs this treatment. And if, if due diligence is applied, might attach a scientific article or perhaps two. Who's the one person who's going to be winning your appeal? Look in the mirror. It's you. <coughs> so what are the correct three things to do when your treatment gets denied? Number one, know your appeals procedure. That's your road map. Number two, find the medical policy statement. How many know what a medical policy statement is? The physicians among us and one or two others. That medical policy statement tells all the reasons they're not going to pay for your treatment. Do you want to see it? I'll tell you how to find it. Number three, study the definitions. We're going to get to experimental later. People often ask me, do I have any appeals left? How long do they have to decide my appeal? What should I do next? I say, it's your insurance company, honey, and you need to know. Study your insurance procedure, your appeals procedure, so you know where you stand. First level, second level. Peer-to-peer -peer review. Don't run through the entire appeals, appeals procedures. They aren't planning to pay for it. What is a peer-to-peer -peer review, by the way? Anyone know? Yes. I call the medical director or the HLP and we sit down and chat about what, what are the pros and cons of what right. I want versus what he does. That's sort of a best... Right, there, that's the key. The way I put it, I'm, I'm a little less diplomatic than you. I say the peer-to-peer -peer review, it's never a peer, and it's not really a review. The peer-to-peer -peer review is where the medical director at the insurance company who denied it the first time calls you up and tells you why they aren't going to pay for it again. I've never been turned down. You haven't. Well, you're one elo eloquent fellow. They do get turned down a lot. Yeah. But, but I Right. And if it were me, I'd have that medical policy statement in front of me and, and say, this is their rationale. So this is what they're... But if you're the patient, don't count on your doctor to necessarily be able to reverse it. Because you can reverse it yourself. The medical policy statement. When you request a treatment that is not routinely offered, do you think that your insurer hits the books? They're going to study that treatment and see if it's safe and effective and go look it up and spend a lot of time learning about it? No. They walk to the computer. They pull their medical policy statement. If the policy statement says pay, they pay. If the policy statement says experimental, they deny. That's what they do. That's all they do in most cases. Wouldn't you like to see that medical policy statement? You can find it on their website. Or if you've been denied, you can request a copy from your insurance company. Disproving the medical policy statement will be the heart of your appeal. Ah, definitions. One of my favorite. You thought those definitions in the back of your benefits booklet were there to help you help you understand insurance company words?
those are legal definitions. They're going to explain all the reasons why they aren't going to pay. As an example, when my treatment, which is cytoreductive surgery and intraperitoneal chemotherapy, was denied back in 2005, the first thing I did, because I'm a word fancier, my qualifications for this job are a master's degree in psychology and a master's degree in French literature. Perfect. I'm a word fancier. So I went directly to the definitions. What do they mean by experimental? Have you ever looked at any of these definitions? They go on for an entire page. They've got all sorts of paragraphs. But just to give you a hint of what's really in there, it said, this treatment must be according to accepted medical practice in the state of Washington. I went looking for accepted practice in the state of Washington. I corresponded with the president of the medical society in my state. I said, what is accepted medical pro for in the state of, he said, I don't know. I went to the library. I camped out in front of an entire shelf of insurance law for the state of Washington. Regulations, revised code. Is there anything there that defines what accepted medical practice is? No. You know what I really discovered? There is no such thing. Those definitions are all smoke and mirrors. There's no there there. In other words, they're so vague, it's easy to disprove them. I love those definitions. Take a look at experimental sometime. I challenge you to do that and see what your policy says. We know what the goal of an appeal is. It's to make your insurance company pay. But what is the purpose of an appeal? Every failed appeal that I've ever seen had a purpose and goal of either blaming the insurance company, begging for the treatment, or trying to educate the insurance company as though they were denying for a lack of information. The blaming appeals look like this, and all these failed appeals are two pages long, by the way. The blaming ones say, I pay my premiums for 20 years, exclamation point, exclamation point. How dare you? Question mark, question mark, question mark. It doesn't work. The begging ones say, but I need this to survive. I will die, if my child will die if he doesn't have this surgery by next week. If begging worked, I'd say crawl on your belly like a snake. Have at it, but it doesn't. They see it all the time, and it truly does not influence insurance companies to pay. An appeal is a strategy game. In order to win a chess game, is it the best thing to leap out of your chair, grab the chess board, and whack your opponent over the head with it? It's a strategy game. Or is it better to know your opponent, keep two or three moves ahead of them, and stay cool, calm, and collected. The purpose of a winning appeal is to intimidate. Your insurer has no intention of paying for your treatment. You need to stop their momentum. You need to stop them in their tracks. The only way to do this is to intimidate them. By that, I do not mean threaten. You're going to intimidate them with a mountain of facts showcased in just the right manner. How will you intimidate a huge, little you, intimidate a huge insurance bureaucracy? You will intimidate them with what you say. You intimidate them with how you say it. But most of all, this is my favorite part, you will intimidate them with who you send it to. After a year of giving free advice about this and saying the same things five or six hundred times, uh, I said, I need to get out of this and move on. I need to get a job.
Maybe I can find a job at Walmart. <laughs> it would be much easier. So I thought, I'm going to write down all of my strategies, all of my verbiage, all of my letters, and I'm just going to give it to people so that they can win their own appeals. When I got done of writing it all down, I said, you know, this is a book. So I found a cancer foundation, and I wrote a grant proposal, and they granted me the money to publish it myself. Now the book helps untold thousands of people, and I help by helping people find the best treatment for their disease and making their insurance companies pay for it. So if this looks like Mount Everest to you, like I couldn't write a 30-page appeal, I'm begging you, plagiarize me. I've already figured this out. I know what words will move insurance companies. I get copies of winning appeals all the time in the mail. They say, you don't know me, but I have your book. You saved my husband's life. And I say, no, I didn't save your husband's life. You saved it. Feels good, doesn't it? So what can we say to intimidate insurance companies? I'll prove my case eight different ways because I want to leave them no exit. We could intimidate them by saying that they might have made mistakes. That's very intimidating. I call this the bad medical story. You know, like when they misread your tests or cut off the wrong leg or, uh, you know, uh, gave you advice that didn't turn out to be so. I know it doesn't sound very nice, but if you want to get out of network, you'll need to tell your bad medical story. You won't blame them. You'll just innocently catch them up on the story, and it will be very intimidating in your appeal. When I take on a case myself, I do a few a month, the first thing I do is spend five or six hours getting to know their insurance company and finding the names of all the highest level decision makers and their private contact information, their fax numbers, their email addresses. And the second thing I do is say, I want you to write down your medical story and send it to me. You don't know what the gold nuggets are in there that are going to scare your insurance company, but I do. That's number one. How about if we tell them that they've paid for this before? Ooh, ouch. How do we find out if they've paid for it before? What we do is we go to our patient community and we find out cases where in different insurers have paid for this treatment. I get their first names, their last names, their date of treatment, whoever did the treatment. I've been doing this for my own treatment for four years. I have a list of 77 cases where insurers have paid before. No matter who the insurer is, I just roll that info right to the top. 38 Blue Crosses and Blue Shields, 14 United Health Cares. I know that this really convinces insurance companies because the first thing they always ask when they see one of my documents, they'll ask the patient, where did you get that information? So I know it's very persuasive. So I would suggest that somebody here start being keeper of the precedent. If you've had a, the pump for Sandostatin or the PRRT in Basel paid for, I'm actually starting a precedent list for that. I have a good one for Y90. So contact me, I'll keep the precedent list for you. Now if you want to get out of network, how are you going to make them do that? Why would they pay for it? You're going to have to prove that the in-network doctors are not as qualified as your out-of-network expert. You're going to have to send them under the bus a little bit. How do I do that? I look up their resume. It's right there on the Medical Center website. There was a little boy recently who's going to a pediatric um, reconstructive plastic surgeon in Dallas who was out of network. He wanted to go there, his family. He needed his entire skull uh, remodeled, taken apart, and put back together again. They wanted, his insurance company wanted to keep them in network. So they were sending him to a plastic surgeon who specializes in rhinoplasties. That, that would be nose jobs, people. 
So <clears throat> I threw that guy with the nose jobs under the bus. I'm sorry, I had to do it. So you prove that the in-network is not offering the same treatment that you'll be getting out. How about my requested treatment will result in a better outcome? Isn't this supposed to be about a best outcome for you? How do we find out if you can get a better outcome? We turn to the scientific studies there. Does this mean I want you to attach scientific studies <coughs> to your appeal? Never. Why do I not attach studies? I don't attach studies because they don't read them, ever. They aren't looking for a reason to pay, you know. You know what I do? If they're not going to read them, I'm going to read them. I read them myself. And I pull out the gold nuggets that talk about outcomes, facts and figures. And I quote them in my appeal. I'm going to make them look at it. No attaching scientific articles. This is a good one. I don't think anyone before me ever thought of this. How about I'll prove that the treatment that I'm requesting will cost less than the treatment that you're requesting. Ooh, baby, the cost comparison. This is supposed to be about money, isn't it? How do I make a cost comparison? Make it up as you go along. Think about the worst, most ghastly, hideous outcome with the treatment they're proposing, and think about the best long-term outcome. Put some dollar figures to it. I'm saving you a ton of money. Very powerful. And you ended up with, and I put titles, intimidating titles on each section. How about this? This treatment is not experimental per Acme Insurance's own definition. Boom. Or this treatment is medically necessary per Acme Insurance's own definition. Shakespeare would call that hoist on your own petard. You take their language and turn it to your advantage. State your points, then prove them with facts. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it takes two pages to state your point, and it takes 34 pages to prove it with facts. Don't worry, you're going to be plagiarizing me. How should you say it? In what manner should you say it? <coughs> People often ask me, do you take a legal approach to writing appeals? I say, no. I take a literary approach to writing appeals. Your appeal is a work of persuasive expository prose with you, a fiction, with you as the main character. When I write an appeal myself, I become you and write it in your words. Your insurance company doesn't care if I'm smart and scary and knowledgeable, but if you are, very, very intimidating. In real life, when I was writing my own appeal, I was ill, I was terrified, I was a nervous wreck. In my appeal, however, I was cool, professional, fearless. Purge every accusation, every feeling word, every emotion from your appeal. They see emotion every day. It doesn't work. The minute you give in to emotion, you have lost your appeal. Wouldn't you rather square your shoulders, keep your dignity, and win your appeal? Now this really is my favorite. Who should you send it to? Every failed appeal that I've ever seen was sent to Joe Post Office Box at the Appeals Department. Are you going to trust your life-saving treatment to Joe Post Office Box? I'll tell you a little review. The purpose of an appeal is to intimidate. So the purpose of your carbon copy list is to intimidate. People usually, if they copy anybody on their appeal, they copy their doctor, 
Now, do you really think that's going to intimidate your insurance company? We love our doctors. And they copy uh, the insurance commissioner. And they copy Oprah Winfrey. Or Michael Moore. Or their state senator. Now, that's, I'll tell you who not to send it to. People would love to believe that there's an outside government entity that will help them with their appeal. Insurance commissioners have no teeth, and they do not intimidate insurance companies. The real purpose of insurance commissioners is to be repositories of insurance laws and regulations. I use them constantly for that. In simple words, you call the insurance commissioner to ask, can they do that? It's a little nicety I put in my appeals. If I can catch them a violating state insurance law, ooh, that's intimidating. But uh, the insurance company, and, and if the insurer sees that you've copied the insurance commissioner on Oprah, they think you just fell off the turnip truck. So who should you copy? You should copy the highest level decision makers at the insurance company. You know, the ones that could approve your treatment with a single signature. Any ideas who one of those might be? CEO, CEO is good. There's even a better one. See, the medical director. The medical director. He's a physician. He's in charge of what medical treatments they pay for and what they don't. CFO is more in like financials, that type of thing. So whatever insurance company it is, I'm looking for the CEO and the medical director. And maybe a juicy vice president or two. Like quality assurance, utilization management, but president, CEO, medical director. One time I asked one of my helpies, I said, go find the medical director of your insurance company. And he came back to me and he said, I called him and they wouldn't tell me. They, these people are very well protected from us. One of the wonderful things about them is that they never see an appeal. So when your appeal gets faxed to their personal fax number, it's powerful. It is powerful. And also, it's a nicety, but in this day and age, many insurance companies are subsidiaries of other insurance companies. Let's say you belong to an HMO called Blue Care Network. Find out if they're owned by anybody higher up. They might belong to Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield. So guess what? Go and find the president of Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield and the medical director. Copy them too. How do you find their personal information? Google. I consider finding personal information for medical directors to be a sport. Give me 20 minutes, I'll find them. They might have attended a meeting one time and they're on the list of participants. Um, I'll find them. And <clears throat> So that's who you should send it to. And the very last person who you send it to is that lowly case manager who is the only one you get to talk to. I fax it to them in the middle of the night, simultaneously. Why do I send it in the middle of the night? So they won't turn off the fax machine. That's 34 pages. And then people ask me, what are they going to do? Every time I do one of these, what are they going to do when they get that? I call it swarming. I said, wait, by tomorrow, they'll be calling you. I call it poking the stick in the hornet's nest, sending appeals to people who've never seen them before, high up. They start calling each other on the phone. What is this? Handle it. And by the time it rolls down to your case manager, are you going to get some service or what? I normally win these things in a week from start to finish. So I just want to hold that out there as a, as a gold standard that you don't need to suffer for four months with these deals. Get in there, plagiarize me, fax it in the middle of the night, and you'll win your appeal. I came here today, all the way from Seattle, to talk to you about words. Insurance company words. I hate the word appeal. It's way too wimpy for me. You know what appeal means? It means to earnestly request. 
to, this is good, to cause a sympathetic response, to appeal to a higher authority. A sympathetic response? You will not win your appeal on sympathy. Earnestly request? No. Cleverly insist. Plead to a higher authority? There is no higher authority. The highest authority? It's you. This is not about insurance. I nearly died of cancer in 2005. If this were about insurance, I would not spend one minute of my precious time on it. This is about taking charge when you feel the most victimized. It's about winning great victories when life suddenly spins out of control. It's about dignity. It's about grace. It's about winning a strategy game with the highest possible stakes, then helping others to do the same. The biggest lesson for me in all this, get a good outcome, but be less attached to outcomes. Regardless of how the rest of my life goes, I'm at peace because I moved heaven and earth to save one precious life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.